Hi, are you property developer? Do you like having nice things? Do you like poor people not having nice things? Then I'm your man, Job at Renrick, that's me. Point finger towards self. Now you, that's right, you can avoid paying taxes and dodge having to provide support to healthcare and education in the most deprived communities. Now all you gotta do for this wonderful opportunity is just give me a briefcase full of money or a sandwich or a a light bulb. I don't really care, I'll take anything. Take that, free school meals, helping you keep the poor out of property. I'm Job at Renrick, and I'm dead inside. Who said we couldn't be satirical here? <laughs> Joking aside, Manhattan is a straightforward family-weighted game. It doesn't complicate matters where you have to acquire resources, assemble construction teams, nor do you have to donate to any housing ministers in order to fast-track your property development in order to Avoid paying tax levies. Nor do you have to beat your fiercest competitors by burying them into the foundations of your buildings. Although after a few rounds of this, the thought may cross your mind. In Manhattan, you play building developers, trying to accumulate the most points over a series of scheduled rounds by stacking different leveled buildings on the board. That's it. Back in 1994, this game won the Spiel des Jahres. It disappeared for a while, it's difficult to get hold of, but back in 2017, a reprint of it was produced. Now, has it stood the test of time and is still good, or has old Father Dime sunken his fleshy gums into it? Let's find out. In Man of Hattan, everybody is going to start with the same amount of structures, made up of one, two, three, or four levels. Depending on the number of players, everybody is going to draft a certain amount of buildings onto their little playing card. You then get yourself four cards, and on them is printed a little grid with one of the squares highlighted. This is going to inform you in terms of what position you can place one of your buildings into one of the six locations. They're orientated as well, dependent on which side of the board you are sat. So on your turn, you can play a card, and then you can place one of your buildings into one of those respective squares anywhere onto the board. You discard that card, draw up again, and play moves on to the next player. As the round goes out, everybody is going to be spending cards and placing out their buildings until there is no buildings left on their card. You can play any size building that you want, provided that you've got it in your supply. And once you've laid down a building, someone else can place one in a different location, or they can build one on top of somebody else's. Now, why would you want to go up and do that, you ask? Well, it's simple, really. It all comes down to points. And as property developers, we're not particularly nice people, you see. Don't let those smiles fool you. Whoever has the top level of a building, it comes under that player's control, and it's only them that's going to be able to score any points for it. Scoring comes in three different aspects. The first respect is that whoever has the tallest building of all is going to score three points. Secondly, in each of these six areas, whoever has the majority of buildings in each area is going to score two points for each of those. And finally, for every building that you own, you score one point. 
Whoa, now, honey pie, things aren't that easy. You can't just go laying down floors on top of buildings willy-nilly. No, there are some rules. If you want to take ownership of a building, then you have to either equal or surpass the number of stories that that building has in your colour. So, in orange here, they've got one floor, but they can equal the majority and take ownership by having the top floor, and they now have two floors. Blue responds, and they lay down a three level building on top. Now they own it, they have more than anybody else. Purple counteracts that, they add on two more, so now they own four floors, that's safe, that's okay. The yellow comes along, places one on top, that's an illegal move. Can't do that, sunshine. At the end of the round, you tally up your points, moving your little markers around the edge on the score track. The First player token gets moved to the next player and you draft another set of buildings, playing it out over again and you just keep repeating this process until all of the buildings have been entirely exhausted. And the grand winner of Mantan Hat is going to be the person who just scores the most points. Hat Mantan is an extraordinary simple game. It's like the designer Andrea Seafarth took those multi-link cubes that you that you use when you're a child in, in your maths lessons to help you count. Like he took those and decided, I'm gonna make a game out of those. The game is so easy to learn. The deck of cards asks, can I build in that square? And the size of the buildings asks, can I build on top of that one? That's all you need to know. It's quite remarkable how such a good game has been made out of such minimal content. Considering its simplicity, there is a degree of depth to this game. Starting off with the drafting of the buildings, you could take a balanced approach throughout, mixing up your small and tall buildings as you go along. Or you could be aggressive right out the blocks, get all your big buildings out early on to establish dominance. Or you could hold back, use your smallest buildings early on, be lurking in the bushes, picking off points wherever you can early on until you unleash your monstrosities until the very end of the game. It's not a brain burner, but there is enough there that's going to make you brush a few bristles. What I really like about this game is the narrative arc that it creates. In the beginning, you're all the best of friends, basking in the early morning dew, hand in hand, skipping through those meadows. You lay out your little buildings across the metropolis, sharing the space with each other. And then this happens! That best friend of yours who shared their yoghurt with you on your first day of school. That best friend of yours who taught you how to kiss. That best friend who saved your ass in now is now dead as this game descends into chaos. Each of you like a ravenous pack of wolves going after the leader, desperately baying for blood, wanting to be top dog. You get embroiled in a bitter war of pride as you build in one spot and they build on top of yours. So you retaliate and build on top again and they build on yours again. Yes, you have spent 20 levels on one building, but at least you can say that it is mine. It's mine. And inevitably, with pride comes a fall as you realise you've ended up in last place. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there and quite frankly, you're pedigree chum, my friend. Then there's the deck of cards. These zonal positions are going to provide a little bit of randomness to the game and they prevent it from boiling down to a simple take that game. You start to strategize. You're thinking, hmm, what building, what area am I going to place my buildings in? You wonder, hmm, should I block somebody off? But in doing so, you know that they are going to retaliate either immediately or later on in the game. Do you let them have their little slice of cake, let them eat it, and just build away from them in a completely new area? You're constantly thinking, you're wondering, right, what can I do so that's going to earn me points? Is there anything that I can do that can prevent somebody else from getting points, and is there anything that I can do that is going to prevent somebody else 
from taking points from me. It's wonderful. These small little deck of cards provide the choice. They allow you to think a few moves in advance. You can also keep cards back as a contingency in case somebody plays something bad against you. Uh, but usually, most of the time, you just draw a card and, and cry because it's, it's, not, it's not the card that you wanted. As the game progresses, you get this stunning vista of this sprawling metropolis expanding in front of your eyes. However, with this increased beauty comes also more precariousness in terms that one simple little knock could have a cascading domino effect on everything else around you, knocking pieces over, breaking towers, and leaving you wondering what, when, where, as you try to remember, well, where everything went. Feels like the designers could have just carved into the board to make some more solid foundations that the pieces could slot into, in, just to create that little bit of stability to it. As well as that, you've got these beautifully etched pieces helping you to signify the number of levels in the building. However, they're only really effective in helping you count the number of levels when you are really close to them or in a very, very well-lit room. One part that really bugs me in terms of the components are the quality of these cards. They're on quite thick cardstock and they have this glossy finish to them. So when it comes to shuffling them, they kind of stick, they latch together. You can't move them around with, with consummate ease like you can with normal cards. I wonder if the game would benefit from a closed scoring system rather than an open one. You see, keeping a visible track of everybody's progress is a good idea. It can prevent a runaway leader. However, if you are the person who's out in the lead, you might as well paint a great big target on your back saying, go on, come and get me, and everybody's just going to gang up on you, stopping you from doing well for the rest of the game. By having it closed, it could add a little element of secrecy, a little bit of mystery to it. The dynamics are going to shift slightly with players working on gut and instinct for who they think they should go after, rather than just automatically giving the person in the lead a big kick in the face. So, what's the cherry on the top, the gravy on the Sunday roast, the moustache on Tom Selleck? Sadly, there isn't one. You see, this game, Manhattan, it's just simply a reprint, and that's it. It hasn't matured like a fine wine, but given it's due, it hasn't gone mouldy. I liken this game more to like a, like a can of baked beans. It's, it's simple, it's hearty, it's, it's reliable, but it's, it's nothing astounding. You see, we've been blessed over the past 20 years that the quality in board game design has absolutely skyrocketed. And unfortunately, Manhattan is just kind of a victim of its era. And with this change over time, as consumers, we have transformed ourselves into those zombies from Dawn of the Dead. We are rabid, always wanting more. We want more lavishness, greater design, greater complexities, custom miniatures. We want so much. And Manhattan just lacks those deeper elements. This, this is a good game, but it's never going to be a superb one. It's like getting a hickey from one of those flesh eaters rather than a full on. If, if you know what I mean. In conclusion, it sounds like I've given Manhattan a fair amount of criticism. However, I still believe it is a very good game. It won the Spiel des Jahres in 94, and for good reason. The following year, a little game called Catan won it, and that game has remained mysteriously popular, just like the way that Paul Rudd has managed to defy the ageing process. To its credit, Manhattan has not withered away like a fart in the wind. Instead, I liken it to Rocky Balboa, an ageing, sagging boxer who you're always going to root for, but you have concern about it battling against its younger contemporaries. I would strongly recommend this game, however, only to the right audience. If you're somebody who plays with a lot of casual gamers, then Manhattan is a worthy contender. It's so easy to learn, and it has the potential to show people that board games can offer more than just roll and move and playing cards. 
If though you don't fit into this category, then this game isn't essential. You can put your £35 to, to better use.